Uh, today in Luke chapter 19, we're going to be we're going to be studying about Jesus's rescue mission. A couple weeks ago, we looked at parables that Jesus taught in Luke. And we realized that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And now in chapter 19, Luke, the author of this gospel of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, reemphasizes the fact to us that Jesus came on a rescue mission to seek and to save the lost. Now, in this passage of Scripture... Jesus is essentially about one week from His crucifixion. This is basically His last stop before He enters into Jerusalem for His Passion Week. And so, look at this, starting in verse 1 of Luke chapter 19. He entered Jericho when it was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we ask that you would bless and honor the reading of your word. And God, it is our desire today to not come with our own thoughts and ideas, but God, for your word, the the source of life, the living and active Word of God, for you, God, to speak to us through your Holy Scripture. Jesus, thank you for coming on a seek and save rescue mission for the lost. And Jesus, help us today leave here knowing that when we encounter you by faith and trust in you, that we are changed to never be the same ever again. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, in the very first verse, there is something important that we must look at, okay? And it really will help set the stage for us in everything that's going on in this passage of Scripture and in the weeks, the week that lies ahead for Jesus. And it says here in the first verse that he entered Jericho and was passing through. He entered Jericho and was passing through. That's an important marker for us in Scripture. Because as we talk about this encounter that Jesus and Zacchaeus have, we we have to understand that there is a bigger picture, there's something bigger here at play, even than just the encounter that Jesus has with Zacchaeus. It is the fact that Jesus is passing through Jericho, and He's passing through because He is heading somewhere. Where he is heading is Jerusalem. Jericho is about 15 miles from Jerusalem. Jesus, for the past three years, had been doing his earthly ministry, but everything had been leading up and had been pointing to this specific time in history. Jesus would go into Jerusalem... He would be betrayed by the Jews. He would be crucified by the Romans up on a hill called Golgotha. And Jesus would carry his cross. And then they would drag him up to the top of that mount. Jesus would lay down his life on the cross. 
and he would be crucified and he would shed his blood for your sin, for the sin of the world. This, my friends, is the most important moment in history. The climax of all events that have ever taken place and ever will take place took place 2,000 years ago when Jesus entered Jerusalem and He went up Calvary and died on the cross for the sins of the world. I've been watching the NCAA basketball tournament. They start off with a bunch of teams and then it gets down to the Sweet 16. Then it goes down to the Elite Eight. Now teams are playing to try to get into the Final Four. And at all of these portions and all of these places, that it's all important. And teams are making history and are a part of history. But the most important part of the NCAA tournament, the climax of it all, will be the last team standing who is number one, who wins the championship at the very end. There's been all kinds of important points in history. There's been many wars that have shaped and changed history. Thousands of years ago, the sin in the world was so bad that God flooded the entire world earth and he wiped everything away except for Noah a righteous man and his family now that's a major major event in history before that before that event when God wiped the earth away with that flood we know that God created. God has always been. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the triune God has always been. None were created. They're God, He, God, He, one God. He is creator. There came a point in time God created. Wow. Wow. What an important point in time. History itself, as we know it, created. Did you know that before God created, He had this plan in place? The preordained and predestined plan of God. That one day, He would send His Son, the second person of the Trinity, to this earth. At just the right time, at just the right moment. And that Jesus would walk this earth, and He would enter in Jerusalem, and at just the right moment would go up Calvary, and die on the cross. The, that is the climax of all history. The glory of God is seen with Jesus Christ hanging there on the cross, dying for your sin. So Jesus is passing through Jericho. And... In about a week's time, he is going to be up on a hill, crucified in your place for your sin. It's amazing when you realize, you know, the Bible tells us that everything was created through Jesus. Okay? It's amazing when we, when we realize that God has no beginning and no end. That Jesus Christ, the Lord, 
He knew from before the beginning of time. He knew about this moment. As Jesus is walking into Jericho that day, He knows He's passing through. And He knows where He is going. He knows He is making His way into Jerusalem to eventually be crucified on the cross for your sin. It says in verse 2 that as he entered into Jericho, look at this, there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that Way. As we think about this story, this account of Jesus and Zacchaeus, and I'm assuming most of us know the story because you learned it as a kid in Sunday school, right? Isn't it amazing to know that with the most important act of of God in history, that it was about to take place, and Jesus still seeked out, loved Zacchaeus, and would eventually save him. Is that not amazing? Listen, the reason I tell you, the reason I just stop right here to tell you that, because I want you to know that Jesus loves you. I want you to know Jesus loves you. That even though he was passing through and going to the place that God had planned from before the foundation of the world, the climax of all history of all time, Jesus still knew that Zacchaeus was there and he loved him and he would meet with him. Now we're going to see that more here in a moment, but I just wanted to go ahead and share that with you. Look, Look at this though. Look at this. We have this man, Zacchaeus. He is a chief tax collector. What that means is that he is the boss of a bunch of other tax collectors. So he's the main man. Now, here's the thing about a a tax collector in Zacchaeus' state. He was a traitor to his own Jewish people. So his own people hated him because he was taking taxes away from them and stealing from them and giving it to Rome. He was a traitor of his own people. He was despised by them. It says in this verse that he is also, in the end of verse 2, that he was rich. See, he was rich because tax collectors were notorious in the first century from stealing more taxes from the people that Rome actually required. And so he would steal extra taxes and he would line his pockets. So he would send his men out and he would say, listen, I want you to take this much more and you're going to give it to me and then I might give you a little cut also. And so Zacchaeus became rich because he was defrauding the people. He was stealing from the people. He's a traitor. He is a thief. And he is also short. He's also short. I mean, we know this about the story, right? It says in verse 3, He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was small in stature. Basically, the picture we have of Zacchaeus here is a shrewd, sinister, short man. Did you read my notes? That's right. Zacchaeus is Danny DeVito's character in real life. (laughs) That, That is who he is. Shrewd, sinister... In short, but it also says here that he is seeking to see who Jesus was. He is seeking to see Jesus. That's interesting. Jesus, here's what we know about Jesus, right? I mean, this point in the Gospels, here's what we know. Jesus loved and was a friend 
of tax collectors and sinners. Can I say something real quick? The Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We should praise God to know Jesus is a friend of sinners. You may say, well, I'm not like Zacchaeus. I'm, I'm not stealing from people like this. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter what sin you commit, you're still a sinner. And Jesus is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Zacchaeus knows this. Jesus has a reputation. I'm guessing perhaps people have been talking to Zacchaeus about Jesus. And Zacchaeus' heart is being pricked and he is being drawn to Jesus. And so here he is. He knows Jesus has a reputation. Jesus is coming to town. And so some would say that Zacchaeus was just curious. I don't think that's the case. I mean, I do believe Zacchaeus was curious, but I believe he was more than just curious to see Jesus who was about to walk through town. I believe I can show you and prove that to you. Put that picture on the screen for us. Now, look at verse 4. He says, So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he is about to pass that way. He is about to pass that way. Let me ask you a question. When, now, pretty much all of us in here are adults. Pretty much all of us. Apart from exercise, apart from exercise, when's the last time you ran? You say, well, I run for exercise, but when you're not exercising, when's the last time you ran? Anywhere. Now, I do that sometimes. Actually, last week, I ran through Walmart from the parking lot all the way into the back of Walmart to the register, self-checkout, and back out because I was in a hurry. And people were looking at me like I was crazy, okay? Now... When's the last time you ran and it wasn't for exercise? When's the last time you climbed a tree? Okay? And you weren't climbing it to cut down branches. You were probably a little kid the last time all of that took place. As an adult, no tree is easy to climb. Okay? Okay? Unless you're a ninja. See, some commentators say... <laughs> so, some commentators say, well, you know, this tree was easy to climb. Well, I did an experiment the other day. There is no tree easy to climb when you're an adult. <laughs> this is a sycamore tree in Jericho by the road there in Jericho. That, that doesn't look very easy to climb. Also remember, he's short. That makes it difficult too. That makes it difficult too. The sycamore tree is a sycamore fig tree, so it actually put off edible fruit. It's a sticky tree. I mean, he ran up ahead because the crowd was so big. Jesus is coming down this road, and people are there. They're just like, we we got to meet Jesus. We want to have fellowship and a relationship with Jesus, and he's, he's coming through. We want to see Jesus. Maybe Jesus will perform a miracle. Maybe Jesus is going to stop, and he's going to teach us something that we've never understood before. And so the crowd is so big. And poor Zacchaeus, he, he, he really wants to meet Jesus, and he just can't get through the crowd. So he runs ahead of the crowd, and he finds a tree, probably with some limbs hanging over the road there. And I... I don't know how he did it, but he climbed up the tree. He got sticky. Listen, this is undignified. When's the last time you ran? When's the last time you climbed a tree? When's the last time you were like, it doesn't matter. I'm willing to get sticky and dirty, even though I'm a rich person who is that I'm trying to put off some kind of reputation amongst the people. No, he, he had this desperate desire and need to see and to meet Jesus. He wants to know Jesus. That's what I believe. He wants to know him. Now go to verse 5. It says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. This is remarkable. Zacchaeus is up in this tree. 
And Jesus is approaching to pass by. But look at this. It says, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus. Jesus knew Zacchaeus was in that tree. Jesus saw Zacchaeus. He could, Jesus could have just walked by, said, I ignore. No, the Bible says that Jesus stopped and he looked up. He knew he was in the tree. He looked up and he saw Zacchaeus. You might be here today and you're going through some major pain. You're hurting. Possibly you're going through something that no, maybe not even your family knows that you're going through. Maybe, it's only, maybe only you know it. But can I tell you something? Jesus knows all about it. Jesus knows where you are. He knew Zacchaeus was in the tree. He knows exactly what you're going through right now. And just as, just as you may be hurting or you may be going through some difficult time in your life, Jesus sees you. He sees you. And it says here that he called Z the name out, Zacchaeus. Is that not amazing? He calls Zacchaeus out by name. Jesus knows your name. The Bible says Jesus knows everything about you. Jesus knows things about you you don't know about yourself. He knows your name and He calls you by name. He sees you. He calls you by name. And Jesus, it says here, invited himself into Zacchaeus' house. He says, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Jesus invited himself into Zacchaeus' house. And I really got to thinking on that, and I thought, why did Jesus say, come down, Zacchaeus, I'm inviting myself into your house today? And the more I thought about that, I realized the intimacy of a house, of a home. You don't let just anybody into your home, do you? There's something intimate about a house. One of my friends that's a missionary has shared with me often that one of the ways that he ministers to Kids that are broken and hurting that come from home. They, kids that don't even have homes. That they, they have no real intimate relationship with a father or mother, maybe even siblings, that they just feel outcast and that there's no place for them. That what he and his family do is they, he invites them into their home. He says, you come sit around my table. You're a part of my family when you're here. A place of intimacy, a special place. Hear me today. Jesus is offering you an intimate relationship with God. Jesus came on a seek and save rescue mission. And Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that you could be forgiven of your sin and so you can have an intimate relationship with the living God. That, my friends, is what salvation is all about today. The forgiveness of God in an intimate relationship with the living God. Look at verse 6. It says, So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully, joyfully. When you study the Gospels, 
here's what you find time and time and time and time again. Jesus called people to step out by faith in public. And we are so uncomfortable with that today in our society. I've ne- I-, I could be missing somewhere, but I have never read Jesus call someone to salvation and not call them to follow Him in public. To make a public profession of His or her faith. It always happened in public. Always. I can't stress enough the importance of a public profession of faith. Almost every meaningful decision that I have made was at the altar or made in public. Almost every single important decision that I've made. When I trusted Jesus by faith, I walked down an aisle and I came to the minister and I had somebody come with me and said, today I surrender my life to Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. After that, I was baptized and I stood before the church in a baptistry And there the minister baptized me in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit where I was able to make this public confession and profess Jesus to the watching world and to say, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. He is my Lord. I am all in. He is my Savior. One of the great days of my life was when I married my beautiful wife, Chelsea. You know what I did to express my love to her? I stood at the altar of a church and there were hundreds of people there to witness as I said, I come into a covenant relationship with, with, with Chelsea and God in this marriage ceremony. It wasn't in private. Listen, if you're going to get married, there's going to have to be somebody there to witness it. There's been many times where I have come just to the altar to pray during an invitation in public. And God used that as a significant point in time in my life. We see it here. Jesus doesn't say, Zacchaeus, you stay in the tree. No. He says, Zacchaeus, come. Come. You come out of that tree, and you come down here. And Zacchaeus, you you can get the tree off. Zacchaeus came out of the tree as fast as possible, and he got down there, and he expressed his love for Jesus. He embraced Jesus. He had joy in his heart. He says, today I'm following Jesus. I've surrendered my life to Christ. Jesus has come, and Jesus has saved me. Now look, in verse 7 it says, When they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Hear me now. Zacchaeus was the last person the crowd wanted Jesus to save. And Let me just put a word of warning out for us as a church. And if you're here today and you're a Christian, know that God desires all men to come to faith in Jesus. And it should be the desire of our heart to see men and women, boys and girls, come to faith in Jesus. And we should be praying for people to do so. We should also be sharing the gospel with people that they would place their faith in Christ. We should be calling for people to make a decision and accept Him, to respond to the gospel message. They were, they were upset. Zacchaeus was the last person. They said, He does not deserve it. And I've got news for us. None of us deserve it. Not a single one of us deserve it. But Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. When you decide to follow Jesus, maybe you're here And you've never stepped out to follow Jesus. You're going to feel like if you make that decision today, 
You're going to feel like everyone in the world is against you. Think about what Zacchaeus felt that day. Everyone around was complaining, was mad, saying, you don't deserve it. And, and the devil, if today God is leading you to follow him and to receive him for salvation today, listen, I, I guarantee you the devil's going he's gonna, to he's gonna do everything in his power and he is not more powerful than God, so you just follow God, but he's going to do everything he can to make you think you don't, that God can't save you, that God doesn't love you, that you can just wait and put it off longer and longer, and you're going to feel like everything and everyone is against you. The world might be against you, but God is for you. When we look at the cross, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is for us. Jesus came to save you. Let me say something else. We are for you. This church is for you today. I am for you. God is for you. And you can follow Jesus. You can follow him today. Let's go to verse 8. It says, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and I have defrauded anyone of anything. I restore it fourfold. I just want to quickly tell you that you can't get saved and stay the same. It's impossible. It's impossible. When you trust in Jesus by faith, Jesus does a work in your life. God, the Holy Spirit, does a work in your life. Jesus transforms you, and your life becomes an expression of a changed life. And that's what we see with Zacchaeus. His life is being transformed by Jesus. He doesn't sell his things off so that he can receive salvation. No, he receives salvation, and God begins to work in his life. Immediately, he says, I cannot be the same anymore. Jesus has changed me. He says, so I'm giving it back, and I'm doing whatever you lead me to do, God. I'm following you, Jesus, a transformed by Jesus. Your life becomes an expression of a life changed. Hear me, you cannot surrender to your life to Jesus and hold on to the things of this world. You surrender your life to Christ. Verse 9 says, And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. There's only one way that you come to Jesus, and it's by grace through faith. You come to Jesus by faith. We've been talking about Zacchaeus here, and we have learned about him in as little kids in Sunday school. You know what else you learn probably as a little child? You learned a song called Father Abraham. He had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. See, that's what Jesus is talking about here. He says, salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. How does one become a son of Abraham? The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, he says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. See, that day Zacchaeus placed his faith in Jesus. He says, He too is the true son of Abraham because he's by faith trusted in me. Genesis chapter 22 tells us that Abraham was a man of faith because God had given him this promised son named Isaac. And then God said, I want you to take Isaac and I want you to sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. So Abraham was obedient to God and he took Isaac up this mountain and he had all the intention in his heart to follow through with what God had commanded. And he laid Isaac down upon an altar as a sacrifice to God. Because that's what God called him and told him to do. Hey, 
When you surrender to Jesus, you surrender everything. If He says to do it, you do it. That's what following Jesus means. And He took Isaac, and He laid him on the altar, and He brought a knife back ready to slay His son that God had promised, and God said, stop it, I see that you do have faith. That you do have faith. Besides, Isaac can't pay the penalty that I actually need paid. Hebrews eleven nineteen 19 says, Abraham believed that God was able to raise him from the dead. Hear me. That's faith. Abraham took his son to the altar to slay him, believing that if it was the desire of God... God could raise His Son from the dead. So He says, I'm willing to do it because I have faith in God. In about a week from this portion of Scripture, from Jesus saving Zacchaeus, Jesus would be crucified for Zacchaeus' sin. He would be crucified for your sin. He would die on the cross. And then God did what Abraham believed God could do. The true seed of Abraham, Jesus, died and they took his body and they placed it in a tomb. And on the third day, God raised his son from the dead. He was resurrected. And he is alive to j- today. Jesus came on a seek and save rescue mission. He entered the pit of death on your behalf. And he walked out holding death's keys alive. Wherever you are in life, whatever you've done, Jesus has offered to come into your house to be your personal Lord and Savior. He, is, he desires to change your life. All I can say to you today is place your faith in Him. Place your faith in Jesus. Your life will never be the same. You will be changed. God will do a miraculous work. It says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And when you today place your faith in Jesus Christ, you, it will be the most important moment in the history of your life. And your life will collide with the most important moment in all history of all time. The cross of Jesus Christ. And you will say, I have been crucified with Christ. It should have been me, but Jesus was on the cross on my behalf. And I've surrendered and I come to Him today. And now, it's no longer I who live, who lives, but it's Christ Jesus who lives in me. Let's pray.